good to see you for our 215th uh, show of FinTechWise Human Humane Architecture. And we're continuing to do what the Hawaiian culture was always doing, being very curious about other places in the world that they can learn from. And since they were doing in mid-century, where you DeSoto were growing up, uh, getting the best of all these worlds. So today it's just the two of us. We have our island's uh, legacy treasurer, Bishop Museum historian DeSoto Brown with us. Hi, DeSoto. Good morning. And myself, Martin Despang. We're missing out on our third party, Ronald Lindgren, who's still consumed with his home improvements back in his Long Beach, California. And we're talking less her facial nature, but serious substantial one. And we'll, we'll keep reporting on that one. And also we're worried about his one beach over, which is Huntington Beach, which is suffering a, just points out how bad fossil fuel is because there's an oil spill there. And it's basically making Huntington Beach, famous Huntington Beach, inaccessible. Just one more reason to get off that nasty black fossil fuel stuff. So in order to still live up to our international profile, having been awarded the show of the year last year, having broadcasted from all over the world, we have our um, uh, exotic escapism expert Susanna stepping up and uh, we send her to the place we are reporting about, which is her second home, where she as uh, sweet 16, as you can see her there, down there, um, uh, basically went for three years until age um, 21, uh, 16 till, uh, or pretty much, uh, yeah, in that, in that range. And she went back to celebrate her uh, bonus mom's 80th birthday. So con congratulations again. And uh, we also have uh, our Tiki Basement expert, Stefan's wife, Kirsten, celebrating her birthday. So celebrating birthday show today. Congratulations to you all. And who else is his birthday is today? So uh, Suzanne went back there, as you can see, it's getting cold there. So she's wearing a sweater and a coat because we're talking about similarities, but also differences, right? And she said, well, there's a saying, the coldest winter is a summer in San Francisco, but she said the coldest winter she experienced was not in her very sort of sub-zero Bavaria where she grew up, where you are basically used to, and both the architecture, whether like the log timber and yourself with your sheep wool woven, you know, you know, attire are prepared for that. But in Portugal, you think it doesn't get that cold, it doesn't get below zero, but it gets down enough to then be very damp and moist. And these traditional houses that you see in the background, they're both her visiting, revisiting on the bottom left, and then her then in that lake at the bottom right, uh, basically they don't have furnaces. They're these old masonry stone houses that get really, really cold. So there's a difference besides all the similarities, there's, there's still sufficient differences. But uh, our last show also uh, was seemed to have been an encouragement on an other end, and that's been portrayed by the pictures above. And you tell us what in what instance, DeSoto. Well, we're going to be talking today about the island of Madeira, and as we just were saying, that's part of Portugal politically. There's also in that area of the Atlantic the Canary Islands, which are part of Spain politically. Then the Canary Islands have a lot of similarities, uh, like Madeira does, to the Hawaiian Islands, because the Canary Islands are volcanic, just as our islands are here are. And in addition to the reinvigoration and re new eruption of Halemaumau, of uh, the summit crater of Kilauea Volcano of, on Hawaii Island, there's also this major eruption going on on the island of La Palma in the Canary Islands, which is being a lot more destructive than our eruption is because it's been just, it has destroyed almost, I think by now, a thousand buildings right in the midst of a populated area. So I've been watching that and seeing a lot of similarities volcanically and geologically between the Canary Islands and the Hawaiian Islands. But we're gonna go to, back to the island of Madeira and look at a particular hotel there 
that yeah. uh, is particularly interesting, attractive, and has a lot of wonderful features. Yeah, and the picture on the top right, just to say that, was just after we ended the show, I thought you had invited uh, Kilauea to be sympathetic and to be in solidarity because it started to show activities as well. And lots of people are going there and want to see that spectacle. So this was just, you know, that article that says lava eruption of Kilauea spews Pele's hair into the Hawaiian skies. So there are the two volcanoes being talking to each other, I guess. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, another sort of uh, global phenomenon next page, again, you're right, DeSoto gets us back to the architecture, is that sort of global pandemic of room renovations in hotels, which no hotel seems to be immune against, even the best ones, as we keep pointing out, top right show quote from last couple of shows about the Mauna Kea Beach Hotel. Uh, hotel pretty much stayed intact and authentic, but the rooms just seem to like every what Suzanne told us every seven to ten years seem to need to get that overhaul in whatever fashion it is, so that the tourists, the guests, the paying customers, so to speak, are basically still feeling they are in an up to date and hip environment. Which, uh, again, the question is, what's so hip about this carpet here? What's about so hip about this sort of get decorative kind of wooden, uh, you know, you know, battens up there and, you know, all these things that sort of questionable because, next slide, uh, we found online uh, that this is how it looked like. And you see, just like in, as we've been talking and recommending at the next uh, interval of renovations to have the Mauna Kea, go back to their original and rebuild it back to the original. Um, we were talking here to the hotel manager and we're instilling in her to say, why don't you do at least, and we were thinking to begin with, restore one back, so like as a historic kind of reference. And then if people would like it that much, then you could say, well, then we keep on going because if people is the customers, right? What they want, you think you have to do. You see here, it's way more sort of restrained and it's all custom made, custom design and custom made and not so overdone as uh, Larry Spricker, uh, you know, was increasingly courageous being critical about what they did to his Manalani. So let's move on. Let's get out of the hotel room next slide and get into the hallway. And what did that remind us of DeSoto, which we show quote on the top right. Well, it reminded us of the Kahala Apartments, which are built outside of the Kahala, what was originally the Kahala Hilton Hotel. And what is particularly interesting, I think, in these groups of pictures is the detailing that is uh, evident in the picture on the left, where the room number is set off in this really striking manner, where there's a little uh, sort of uh, depressed area that's got a light above it. And I'm glad that that is still there because this is a picture you took, correct? So that's, yeah. that detailing is still there in the hallways. Um, otherwise, you've got a similarity of being able to look down to the end of the hallway and see an open door or an open window, not open, but I mean open to the light, which is certainly a more inviting thing than a closed off and entirely concrete vista. But I'm particularly fond, as I said, of that that picture on the left, because that's a really cool detail that I've never seen in a hotel before. It, it is. And the, the bottom right shows uh, there is something that we wish, or we were first curious that we didn't see it in the uh, Kahala apartments. But the reason is because the end units where you wish there was some sun and light pour in, as it does here at the bottom right of this hotel, it doesn't do it at the, um, uh, at the Kahala apartments because there's the most pricey unit facing the ocean, so they didn't want to interrupt that. But um, if we go back to the picture above, which is the Kahala Apartments, uh, you basically have light from the side pouring in every now and then in these intervals where, uh, where these uh, sort of circulations come in uh, from the side. So you have that. Yeah, and the very top right picture is the 1315 Alamoana Boulevard, where we also wished it would have that end light of the tunnel, so to speak. 
and our uh, friends and and tenants, uh, Alexei and Nicole. By by the way, hi. We haven't we have to get together. It's been a while. It's been too long. Who are reno or have been renovating a corner unit, an ocean corner unit? Alexei walked me through the through the hallway. You know, and he he grew up what they call behind the uh, the Iron Curtain. He grew up in in Russia and has you know seen you know, hotels, double loaded corridors of that socialist era. Uh, and we will get to talking about socialism when we put Niemeyer, the architect here in context further down the line. And he was like really, you know, paying attention to the, to the even the, the, the unit numbers. And he was pointing out the new ones, the hideous ones that tenants had basically replaced. And he, he pointed out to a couple of authentic ones and original ones. And they're really sort of crisp and delicate, and they choose a nice typeface for that. So it's the the devil, or you know, positively speaking, God is in the detail. So these little things, as room numbers, you know, really matter. So we urge everyone, not just owning hotels, but owning condos, to do research and, if possible, and you make it possible because if there's a will, there's a way. You bring it back to the original, and. Um, Talking, being iconic, let's now move back from the hallway into the main circulation space. Next slide. Wow, right? Yeah. What did That's, you say? That is something Super called graphics. Uh, yeah, what you that is it. something from the, the time period in which this hotel was built, in which was uh, opened about 1976 or 77. And this was a fad called super graphics, meaning that you put the numbers that were uh, for identifying rooms or floors or even exteriors of buildings, you could you could make them uh, part of the graphics. You could make them part of the appearance of the building. And here we see that this is obviously the fifth floor because the five is huge, but it's very typical of that time period. And it's something that, again, should be preserved because it was the original intent of how the building was done. So I'm grateful in this situation that that's still there because it's really distinctive looking and you wouldn't see it today. People would not do it today. It's not the 1970s anymore. Yeah, and given they're sort of basically demonstrated through that big display in the, in the entrance foyer of the lobby where they speak about you know the architect and have his sketches up there. You would be hopeful that they're aware that this is all stuff to be maintained. The carpet, however, looks kind of, you know, dated and has seen its better days. And, you know, probably carpet for, I always think carpet in, in the, for public buildings is stupid to begin with. But, I mean, speaking about uh, behind the Iron Curtain, I had the chance in my, when I was a student, uh, or the equivalent of the AIA, the BDA in Germany, we had um, a trip uh, long planned and finally approved by the GDR. That was be the year before the wall came down. And they put us up in this intercontinental hotel that they had. And that was like the thickest carpet I've ever seen in a hallway. And that uh, we heard that was sort of soundproofing, right? Because they weren't so good in solving their technically. So there's a sort of funny, a carpet is a funny sort of similarity between communism and capitalism in America. and and all these, uh, you know, communist countries there. This is a, but anyway, so the carpet is a keeper. You just got to pick a new one with the same color, best case of the same brand, right? Because it's, it's about authenticity. So um, we, we could have thrown in a, also um, one of the, our favorite modern master buildings is the Alamoana building uh, of the mall. Uh, that they stripped it off the beautiful um, shading um, feather cape uh, stupidly. But the situation when you get off the elevator is not unsimilar. It's actually, there's, they sacrificed some unit space that they could rent out and bring natural daylight from the side to where you exit the elevator and go into the hallway. So a similar kind of situation of sort of luxury uh, that that seemed to be a no-brainer for mid-century, which now we, these days we try to squeeze out. You know, every square footage should be rentable and sellable, right? So we miss out on these great opportunities, and we forget that the people who buy then or rent for big money 
you know, going to suffer from that for the rest of the duration that they live in there, right? Right. So right. Uh, let's how they uh, made that fenestration architecturally. Let's go to the next slide. This is a detail of basically the same sort of checkerboard facade continuing over the lobby. So you basically don't see any differentiation on the first glimpse. The second glimpse you see, you know, you see behind it's more, you know, it's open all the way to the other end. So at, at the next, at the second glimpse or at night, you will see it's not a hotel room. It is the, it is the you know, the, the very, very generous sort of semi-public space. Um, that um, you get into when you're getting off the elevator or in a very sort of, uh, you know, uh, pre-fossil or hopefully in the future post-fossil way again, there's another way to get up. And that particularly fascinated you overall and in its details, and that's the next slide. Yeah, this is a really striking circular staircase. And I am, very fond. First of all, I like brutalism, so I like raw concrete. The central spine of this stairway is kind of this untreated rough concrete, uh, which you can see looks like it was just built fairly recently. But it contrasts with these other elements, which are smooth and finished. I really enjoy when architecture puts contrast together, smooth surfaces versus rough texture surfaces so that you see them combined. And in this stairway, the concrete of the steps itself is smooth. And then there's another little level on top of those that is maybe marble. And then this beautiful sinuous curve that goes down of the railing, not only the polished wood on both inner and outer sides, but the two parallel lines of the metal bars that continue down as well. I just think that this is masterful and I love the way it looks. And I'm really happy to see this. And I'm glad you took a bunch of pictures of it because I'm probably not gonna to get to Madeira itself to ever see this in my per in my personal life. Well, we, we hope so, don't say that. Everyone should uh, we'll go see. Now. We'll see. <laughs> and uh, you also, I teach you at times, you know, the weekly German lessons. And you teach me uh, sort of cosmopolitan terms. And I have to say, bad student I have, I haven't memorized enough. So you got to help me out one more time and share the bridge again between stalactite and stalagmite. Oh, yeah, okay, and, and say okay. what's the context here about that. Okay, okay. So uh, stalactite comes from the ceiling and oh, it has to go. hold on tight so yeah. that it doesn't fall. A stalagmite, which is, comes up from the floor, might tip over. And that's something um, I learned 60 years ago in school. All right, so I should be able to memorize it from <laughs> now. And so this is like, we say this because this seems to be like the, the, sh the, the, the core, it seems to be like shooting up from the ground, right? Almost like lava shoots up and even the materiality we like to call here Volcrete, which is our word invention of volcanic concrete where you use the local ingredients that they have been using, and the the absolutely um, uh, you know engineering uh, ingenuity of this one here is is that these stairs are obviously can't levering off that central core and go to the next slide. That then gives this fantastic you know play of light that the light is pouring through the gap between as you you know perfectly put it this sort of smoothened out and sort of like you know, um, leaving its its texture of making uh, more industrial concrete in comparison to the very sort of, uh, you know, uh, brutalist, almost like um, reminds us of our um, Royal Hawaiian Shopping Center um, and other Paul Rudolph basically, you know, fluted sort of block and chiseled away and bush hammered kind of concrete. And then you see these stairs there projecting out and next slide is showing what you already said, but more in detail is this very super sexy differentiation between the structural stair slab and then the one that you actually touch with your feet and there's, they're distinguished by materiality. So you step on that, you're right, probably marble what you said, you know, but that one is carried very elegantly by that smooth concrete that then sort of projects out of this sort of lava fountain of Volcrete. 
Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I, I agree. So let's go to the next slide. And we found um, one image here online that intrigued us because, first of all, it's uh, reminding us and the audience about what we can continuously say, never paint concrete, because once painted, it's ruined. And uh, concrete in these days, when you use the fiber reinforced mesh and not rebars that could rust, there's no spalding issue anymore. So for sure today, more than ever, uh, there's no there's no problem with that. But even with old buildings, I still, even though you said, you know, sandblasting the old paint off is pain in the bud and it's hard to do, but you can do it. And then there, there are sealants there that you can put over it. And you know, there are even some that are not glossy. So you're retaining the original uh, authenticity of, of the appearance of the building, which is so much stronger in its rawness of that extruded concrete bar than it is where it's very sort of neutrally painted white these days. And we last minute threw in while rehearsing that little show quote in the very top up, top right up there and reference what we see at the bottom of the big picture to Soto, right? Right, because uh, in the picture below, the, the large picture, there are these animal drawn carts that people are riding in right next to in front of this hotel. Now, in the Hawaiian Islands, we stopped using animal drawn mass transit way back in 1901. That's when there had been animal drawn uh, tram cars, they were called, and they were replaced by electric street cars. Here in Madeira, these look like they're pulled by buffalo or by steers. And uh, they are there obviously to take tourists around just for fun. But it's an interesting contrast between that very archaic type of uh, transportation and this modern 1970s building. And we were also talking about the texture of the concrete that you can see on this side wall of the building, which is still looking kind of fresh and perhaps sort of raw. But you don't have to think that that's a bad thing because gradually through time, that raw quality is going to go away. And through the uh, through yes. weathering and use mm -hmm. and whatever, it'll go away and you don't need to paint it to make it look different. Just yeah. let it weather and become, as you were saying, a little more textured, almost to the point where the concrete is not as hard surfaced, but because it's got microscopic pits in it, it's now almost a little textured, almost like velvet. It certainly doesn't feel like yeah. velvet, it looks but like it's got it, a yeah. little more, it's not yeah. quite as raw. No, Keith, I, I had to get a new phone. My, my, uh, my iPhone SE pulled me through two years of COVID, long distance teaching, just hotspotting all the lectures, everything. So. And talking sort of like, you know, dragging and the mule, it was basically, you know, time to, it was getting tired and so it needed to be replaced. So I got a new phone. I'm still not used to all the functions. So there's like an Apple based newsletter feed in there and it popped up and I read that Jamie Lee Curtis is, is warning people to get plastic surgery. She said, let's just, you know, let's just, you know, let yourself be, be aged and grazed. And that applies to people and buildings, right? People age the most naturally and the most beautifully and the most gracefully the way they are. And that's true for, for all of us. I that. agree. I and agree. Um, in the middle of that, of that front of concrete, you see that shadow reveal, and that's where the light pours into the end of the hallway, right? That's the end of it. But on the other end of the building, uh, the building continues to be very spectacular, it even gets even more spectacular. Let's go to the next slide. For that one. So it pours into the ocean with a sort of wavy, sort of, you know, flipped on the side wave of, of mullions that if you look at them in an angle, they stagger. And this is a pretty huge window wall, and the profiles are amazingly fragile um, and, and elegant for that. So go to the next slide. And on the outside, it curves around to, to the exterior leisure areas here. And there, this is portraying perfectly that Niemeyer, the architect, grew up in the tropics because he recognizes you need to wear a hat 
a big hat in the tropics that that shades you first of all and then also it rains and that's similar to us here so every building in hawaii should recognize that but decreasingly buildings do that and there are buildings online we're a little sort of paranoid with all the copyright you know dilemmas so we're preferably taking pictures that we took which was our goal to begin with but Every once in a while, we spice it up with something and check the copyright. But there are pictures out there where, at this point, again, the hotel was closed. We were there, and the manager kindly let us in. But um, um, you know, there are pictures out there where people have are on their lounge chairs, on their sun deck chairs, and basically enjoy the shade there. That's uh, really and look at the crazy. We once did a show, crazy cantilever ring, something yep. like that, canopies, and canopies. That's certainly like a late entry for that one right yes look at that yes. one yes so um we are getting close to the end of the show but let's do one more slide here and that is sexy curviness about niemeyer it doesn't <laughs> stop anywhere right it's the architectural right. exterior it's the architectural interior and it is the furniture design and everything is basically custom designed and we will touch on the aspect of 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 the vintage of uh, of architect design furniture uh, next week when we wrap this up, but this is sort of a pre glimpse for that. So uh, yeah, so maybe we do talking pre glimpse. One last slide using as the goodbye slide. Uh, so next slide, because this is the uh, this is the bar there, and we will share with you the detail of that next week. And again, you're. And I'm not absolutely sure, not everything in the hotel is still the original, but most of it is. And, and this one here, we, after a long sort of, you know, looking into it and analyzing it and the pictures and talking, we believe it is. And why that is, we leave for next week. So you're going to tune in again next week. We're going to zoom into this and do further detective work together. Right. All right. And until then, uh, see you next week. Obviously, until then, uh, stay all um polynesian and macaronesianly exotic <laughs> bye bye bye